the storm. You remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith, I see the future I picture slowly fade away. And when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face, I find my peace in Jesus' name. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When they let me go and I just don't know how I'm gonna make ends meet. I did my best, now I'm scared to death that we might lose everything. And when a sickness takes my child away and there's nothing I can do, my only hope is to trust you. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. In the eye of the storm, in the eye of the storm. you remain in control. Yes, you do. In the middle of the war, in the of the war. you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn. Well, for those of you who are in the sound of my voice this morning, you have joined the online version of the service for the Central Church of Christ in Sarasota, Florida, and we're glad you're with us. We hope that you will come back and join us again next week and every other week while we're still online. However we are, some of us are meeting in person at this very hour at 1030 at our church building at 6221 Proctor Road in Sarasota. And if you would like to join us, we would love to have you. Of course, we're observing all the rules, mask and social distancing and wiping down surfaces and washing our hands and doing all the things that are necessary to keep each other safe. But we will be glad to have you. You'll find that in the live version that we're having a much more laid back service these days. And we'll do so until we can all meet again and we begin to fill up the room again. But uh, we hope that you could join us. Uh, in person, but if not, continue to watch us online and we will try to stay together and stay on the same page with each other in this way. It is a blessing. It is indeed a blessing to be able to to uh, serve God and to be able to uh, be a part of his kingdom and to do things that will bring glory and honor to his name. So today we're going to continue uh, our messages as we have in the past and after we're done with the message this morning, we'll have a time of celebrating the Lord's Supper together. We're going to do a one-part series. I never do, hardly ever, one sermon that is just set apart by itself. But I am today, and I've entitled the sermon, Why Tests Are Necessary. Why Tests Are Necessary. There was a few times in my life that I sweated taking a test. Most of the time, tests came pretty easy to me. They didn't bother me too much. I always felt like I was pretty prepared to take the test. But there were a few times in my life where I just really uh, did not look forward to taking a test. One was in a class called Ancient and Medieval History under Dr. Muncie in my undergraduate work at Harding University. He would cover about 500 years of history discussing matters of politics and science and wars and cultural matters and religious religions and and the like 
all kinds of facets of what happened during that 500 years of history. And then when it came to his test, he would normally have three essay questions, maybe sometimes two essay questions. And generally speaking, we knew what he was going to ask. He was going to give us a particular aspect of some kind of uh, concept that he wanted us to trace through 500 years of history and he wanted us to show an example in all those different categories. An example from politics, an example from science, from the wars that were fought, from the cultural matters at hand, and also from the religions. And he wanted us to be very precise in documenting all of the aspects of that concept in those different parts of society. And that was very, very hard for me to do because he covered a lot of material. He gave us a lot of things to remember. And to be able to trace one concept through all of those things, just, I tell you what, I struggle with that and barely, barely survived that class. And, you know, there are other examples of times where I just kind of sweated, like in New Testament Greek. I wasn't particularly good at New Testament Greek. And when it came time for the test, uh, I just kind of sweated those tests. And then there was this time when I was, in, uh, I was in Holland for a summer, and it was a mission internship, again, a class for Harding University. And one of the requirements was that we were to take a language course from a local tutor. And her name was Mafrau Freda. My Frau Freda was a tough teacher. We came to her class on the first day, and she says, I'm going to talk to you in English today. I'm going to give you your book workbooks. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. But the next time you come to my class, I am only going to talk to you in Dutch, in the language of Holland, which is called Nederlandse Taal. I did remember that. And so we would show up, and she's talking in Nederlandse tall, and I am understanding almost nothing of what she is saying, but she's trying to teach me the language by speaking the language and by giving me a workbook that had no English in it, and I was completely lost. I'm not very good at languages anyway. And it's the only class, I'm going to confess, the only class I dropped out of. I just could not complete the class. But looking back, Every one of these tests that I had in my life contributed to my education in some way. Even the, even the ones that I nearly failed and even the class that I dropped out of contributed to my education in some way. But those are one kind of test. And just like you, I had other tests in my life that were much more difficult. They weren't written tests. They were not in classrooms. They were the, in the test of life. One of them was when my mother died when I was 15 years old. That was a test. And I can tell you that I'm still taking that test because it still is something in my mind and in my heart and something I will probably carry to my grave. And then when I found myself for the first time in the darkness, and I'll have to describe it as darkness because Haiti is something you have to learn to see the light in. Because when you first come to that country, it seems so dark. And when I came for the first time, I, I was thinking, what am I doing here? Why am I in this work? And it was a test to see whether or not I would make more than one trip to that country. And now after 35 years later, having made multiple trips, well over 30 or 40 trips to that country, I can tell you that what I've learned about that country is much different than my first impression. There's been some difficult times in my marriage. There's been some difficult times in raising my children. There's been some challenges with unhappy church members and many who left the church. That's been a great test of faith for me. And now the current test of COVID-19 and this effect on us personally and as a church is something that I'm having to deal with and you're having to deal with. All of these are tests that we're going through. And I can understand why sometimes we're just like, could I please have a break? 
from taking a test. I would just like to kind of enjoy the class for a little while. Well, here's a prayer for the tested. It's found in Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That is a good prayer for those of us who are being tested to invite God to search us and to test us to know our anxious thoughts, to see if there is any offensive way in us. Do we ever reach the point where we invite God to test us, to see who we are, to see what we're made of? What is it that God is looking for when he tests us? And why are these tests necessary? Well, those are some of the questions that we're going to answer today why are tests necessary why do we go through things in this life that are unpleasant things that cause us to have to look deeply inside of ourselves to see who we are why we're here and where we're going well i'm going to give you about four things that i believe are always a part of the tests that we're involved in and they tell you why you're going through them and so the first one is this those of us who are Christians are a part of Christian ministry. And all of you in the church are a part of the ministry of the church. And constantly, the ministry of the church is being tested. People are being challenged in various ways. And sometimes we don't like the test of the ministry. And some people, when they feel like they're being tested or that they're going through something in the ministry, some people just simply want to run away, find another place, do something that will bring them personal peace, but they don't want to go any, through anything in the ministry. And so Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, has a section here where he talks about the tests of the ministry. He was going through some tests in Corinth because it's a church that he planted and that church was full of all kinds of problems and, and issues that needed to be confronted and it was testing Paul. Paul was, and, and many other people were being put through the ringer in that church because there were so many problems there. So here's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 10, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder re will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Paul saw the church at Corinth being put through the flame to see what it was made of. The church there in Corinth was described as God's building, was described as the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that temple was being set on fire in a test to see what it was made out of. Now, I didn't say God set the fire. I didn't say God is the one who initiated the test. But there were reasons why the church was going through its problems. And God used the as an opportunity to test his people to see what the work was going to be made of. What is the quality of the work? The quality of the work here in this place at Central, as we undergo 
this test of the COVID virus, being separated from one another, to see whether or not we will survive, whether or not we are close enough with each other, to see whether or not that we are of one mind and of one judgment, to see if we love each other well enough and strong enough, that when all of this is over, will we be back together again? I can tell you some churches are beginning to sweat it. Some church leaders that I know are beginning to wonder if all of their people will come back again when it's all over. And it's something that all of us think about because we know that this is not the ideal way to do church. I am glad we have this way. I'm glad we are able to broadcast in this kind of way. But this is not the ideal way to do church. And we wonder when all of this is over and we're, we're certain that we are free of this virus and we can safely come back together, is it going to be something where we see all the people that we saw before we shut down? I'm so glad to see the ones who are able to come back now. And I understand all of you are not able to come back yet. But I am so glad to see the ones that are able to come back and to see that they show up. It's such a wonderful thing to be together. Our ministry is being tested to see what the quality of the work that we have done in the past, to see what that quality is and whether or not we will survive this. I believe that we will, and I believe that we're working hard in various ways to do that. And I want to encourage all of you to put all of your energy and effort to staying together as one body. The second thing that we are tested in regard to is our faith. Our faith is being always tested to see what it's made out of. James chapter 1, you know the passage, chapter, starting with verse 2, it said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And perseverance um, must uh, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. And then down in verse 12, he says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive a crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The testing of our faith. We go through so many tests. You know, I say I believe in Jesus. I, I say that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I say that there is nothing to fear in Christ. I say that I have the blessed assurance of knowing who I am and where I'm going. I can say that I know and I believe that God will not allow me to be tempted beyond what I'm able to bear. I can say that God has given me these great and precious promises and that he's given me everything that pertains to life and godliness. I can say that God has done exceedingly abundantly more for me than anything that I ask or imagine. But when the time of testing comes, do I stand my ground? Do I allow myself in those times of stress to believe that God is there with me and that he will see me through anything? I want to tell you about one man, and, and I don't really know anything about him except one thing is said about him in the Bible, but I think this one thing is enough. The man's name is Apelles. Apelles. I would pretty much wager that most of you have never heard of him but he is mentioned in Romans 16 and verse 10 Paul simply says greet Apelles whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test fidelity is faithfulness to Christ he has stood the test now I don't know what he went through I don't know anything about his life. I don't know about the trials and the tribulations he went through. But I know his faith was tested and he stood the test. And so I encourage you that when you are tested, give consideration to your faith of whether that faith is strong or if it's weak, will it even stand because when you're weak, you can be strong because of God's power at work within you. And so what is the testing of your faith? Testing of your faith is to see how much you believe in the promises of God. 
how much you believe that God is faithful to you. And so when your faith is tested, will you stand the test? The third thing that gets tested is our obedience. Is our obedience. God wants to see if we are willing to obey Him. If we will do what He says to do. Now this seems so simple. But you know, when we think about how serious it is about our faith, that if we have genuine faith, that faith must be put into action. It, it is dead faith unless it works, unless it does something. If we merely listen to the Word and we don't do what it says, then what good is that? And so we have to find out whether or not we will be obedient to God. I've had opportunity recently to challenge a few of us in some areas of that's been a little uncomfortable. Some things that I've encouraged you directly from God's Word, not something I've made up for you to do, not some, some uh, test of obedience that I've given you, but simply one that is given by Jesus Christ Himself. So when you read in Scripture and get, Jesus says to do this or do that, to handle it this way, don't do that. Do you obey Him? Are you obedient children? In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul is writing, and the context here is about a man who had some sin problems in his life. He has talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And it seems those people withdrew fellowship from him because Paul told them that's what they needed to do in order to be obedient to God, not to destroy the person, but to save him. And it seems that this person did repent. But there was a no, now there was an opportunity for them to renew their love for this man. And so this is what Paul writes. He says, I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. You see, he challenged them in 1 Corinthians 5 to deal with the sin of this man, to even withdraw fellowship from this man. And they did that. Now he wants to see if they will be obedient to the next step in the process. And that is renewing their love for this man who has repented of his sins, and to reaffirm that love to him. Sometimes that's harder to do than it is to hold someone accountable for what they've done. But Paul is saying, this is a test. I want to see if you're going to be obedient in everything that God has said to do. And so every one of us, when we go through Trials and tribulations and problems and issues in this life. God is watching because God wants to see whether or not we're going to be faithful in our obedience. And then finally, we are tested in whether or not our love is sincere. Do we have sincere love? Now the illustration I would use is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The context here is, is that Paul has been talking about a collection that is going to be made for the poor saints in Jerusalem and that he has uh, asked the various Gentile churches to contribute to this cause. And the Corinthian church has agreed to do that. He even told them in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 to take up a collection every Sunday so that when he came, they would have the ability to contribute to this mission. But it seems that the Corinthians had not yet fulfilled their obligation, what they had promised to do. Now he's going to mention the Macedonian churches like Philippi, about how they have, even in extreme poverty, how that they have given to the cause themselves. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says, And now, brothers and sisters, I want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up to enrich generosity. 
For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. There is a time when we need to compare ourselves with other people. When we see people who are being faithful to the Lord, people who are fulfilling their obligations, who are being consistent in their giving, who are fulfilling their, the responsibilities that God has given to them, we need to be encouraged and inspired by their example. And we need to be tested in our love and our sincere love that we have in our hearts of whether or not we are going to fulfill the obligations that we have as well. And so there is the testing of our sincere love. When we make, when we make promises, do we keep the promises? Do we do what God tells us to do? Because it is supposed to be out of our love. In this case, their love for the poor saints in Jerusalem and their love for God and their love for Paul. And so, our love gets tested in these ways. So what is the test of, about? Why is it necessary for us to know something from a test? Why, why do we go through these tests? Well, there's some things that we need to know about. We need to know about the quality of the work that we do, the ministry that we're a part of. Is it strong? Is it going to last? Or is it going to be burned up in the fire? So it gets tested to see what it's made out of. Our faith gets tested to see if our faith is strong and whether it will sustain us through the problems of life. Our obedience is tested to see if we will do what God has actually told us to do, if we'll follow through with what He told us to do. And our love gets tested to see if it is sincere love, to see if this love is genuine love. And if it is, then we know, we have an assurance then that God is pleased with us, that God says you're doing good. I tested you and you're learning and you're growing and I see evidence of all of the great work that God has done in your life, all the great work that Christ has done in your life, all the great work that the Holy Spirit is doing in your life all the great work that other people have done in your life, we're seeing that is paying off and that you are passing the test and that you have stood your ground in the test. And so what is, why is it necessary to be tested? Because that's the only way that we're going to know how well we're doing. I don't enjoy tests but I want to know how well I'm doing and I want to know how well God thinks I'm doing. We're going to, in a few moments going to take the Lord's Supper together. I invite you to stay with us. And then I would also invite you to visit our website, centralsarasota.org. And you'll find there a whole host of resources that we have available to you. One of the things I've enjoyed, and I have to say, I, I did the preaching on it, but I, I've enjoyed going back to what has been called Throwback Thursday. It's some of the old sermons, and these weren't that old. It was back in 2018, I believe, when I did a series of sermons on grace and truth. And I've, I'm, I've just have gone back and been reminded of some of the things I was studying back then, and, and I needed to hear these lessons over again, too. And so I would encourage you to take a listen to the great in, grace and truth series that is being presented on Thursdays is, is premiering on Thursdays and uh, then you can go back and hear them anytime 
We're going to try to do that with some other messages that we can find in the past that have been archived. But we're trying to give you many, many tools and resources that you can use in your personal life for growth, but also to use to share with your friends and your neighbors, people that you can influence in the body of Christ. So thank you for joining us. I'll see you in just a few moments with the Lord's Supper. Thank you for joining us for the Lord's Supper this morning. I'm going to be reading a passage from the Old Testament. It is a passage that was not written by David. It was written about David. And I want to compare some things that are said in this passage with some things about Jesus. We are here to remember Jesus. But in this occasion, on Psalm 132, the people who wrote this and sang this particular song were remembering David. And here's what they sung. O Lord, remember David in all the hardships he endured. He swore an oath to the Lord and made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes, no slumber to my eyelids, till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. Now most of us know that David was the one who wanted to build the house of the Lord. He wanted to build the temple. And God told him that because he was a man of violence, because he had spent most of his life in war, that he would not be allowed to build that temple, that his son would have to do it. But nevertheless, David wanted to see it built. And so even though he could not personally build the temple, he did everything within his power in order to provide for the temple. He gave out of his personal wealth. He admonished the people of Israel or Judah to do the same thing. And he collected probably thousands and thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of gold and silver and bronze in order to build this temple. But one of the things that is said about David here that he swore an oath to God. And that oath was that I'm not going to go into my house. How can I live in this beautiful house of cedar? How can I live in this beautiful palace that I have built for myself I'm not going to go to my bed I'm not going to allow sleep to come to my eyes 
until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. During those last hours that Jesus was on this earth, he slept very little. He did not allow any sleep to come to his eyes. In fact, he lived his whole life for this one purpose. And that was to create a dwelling, a temple, if you will, in which all of us could live with God in the Spirit. Jesus came to prepare a place, a temple, a dwelling place for us to be with God. And Jesus did not want to sleep. He didn't want to eat many times. He, he was so dedicated to that one goal that he gave us all for it. David did the same thing for the temple that he wanted to build for God. And so here we are today. We have the opportunity as God's people to be the temple of God. That we are here not simply to celebrate some kind of place that we're going to one day. And there is a place that he's preparing for us one day. But we have an opportunity to be that place right now. And it's all because of what Jesus created. It's all because of what he did upon the cross for us so that we'd have the ability to live with God now and forevermore. So wonderful to think that we too have the ability to create new temples for God every day as we share the gospel and as we bring new people into the kingdom of God because the Bible also says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And every time a new soul is won to Christ, a new temple is erected and God has a new place to live. Oh, that all of us would let a little less sleep come to our eyes. Oh, that all of us would allow a little more dedication to the, to the goal of seeing more and more temples erected to God, both in church plantings and reaching people with the gospel. And so that's what we celebrate today in the Lord's Supper. You remember Jesus said that the temple is tore down, I will rebuild it in three days. The temple he was referring to was the temple of his body. And that is what we celebrate today. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ symbolized in this bread. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus and sending him in bodily form so that that great temple in which you lived while he was upon this earth, that even though it was torn down, you resurrected it in three days. And now, Father, as we take into our bodies this bread that represents the body of Christ, then help us to be a temple in which you live. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we partake of the fruit of the vine that represents the blood of Christ, let's pray. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. May we all dedicate ourselves again to this great, great mission that you have called us to, to erect more and more temples upon this earth to you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a part of the Central Church of Christ, we invite you to make a contribution today. You can do that online by going to our website 
or you can send it in the mail if you would rather do that. But we appreciate your continued support for the work of the ministry here at Central and around the world. Again, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to being with you on other occasions online. And again, if you're able to come out next Sunday, we would invite you to come and be here with us at 1030. And we will worship in person together. God bless you. Yeah.